So welcome everyone and thank you guys for joining us for this month's Digging In with TPS MTSU. We're really excited to have you join us um, this month as we explore a landmark Supreme Court cases. So a few things um, as we get started. Um, again, just a reminder, uh, for those of you joining us live today, please um, keep your mics muted throughout the presentations, uh, just to help us have a cleaner audio for the recording. Um, and if you would go ahead and rename yourself so we see your first and last name in the participant list, that just helps us uh, to kind of keep track of who's in attendance and who we're talking with in the chat rooms. Um, and then also, if you would, uh, you know, be sure to make use of the different ways that we can make this session as interactive as possible. Um, so we will be making use of our chat box throughout the session. Uh, if you haven't already done so, open that up, introduce yourself. Uh, and again, be, you know, feel free to use that as a place to, uh, to drop in comments or questions throughout the presentation. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Stacy Graham and Layla Smallwood will be monitoring that and responding to those again throughout the presentation. Uh, we also have uh, reaction buttons that you can use, uh, and I don't think we're doing any polling today, but we do occasionally use that as an interactive feature. Um, and then again, we have a Padlet uh, for this series, and so you can find uh, the link for that here or, or use the QR code to access that, and that's where you can find all of the different resources uh, for both today's session as well as for all of our past uh, webinars in this particular series. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Graham, who is going to talk with us about our, uh, our theme for this month. Yes, thank you, Kira. And for starters, I do want to say um, happy Veterans Day. Uh, if we have any veterans or family members of veterans out there, uh, that is the reason why I am at home today, um, because Rutherford County Schools is closed for today because of Veterans Day and I'm home with my daughter. I am going to share my screen so that we can take a look at this month's newsletter. Um, as Kira mentioned, the theme that we chose for this month was landmark Supreme Court cases. So what does it mean to be a landmark Supreme Court case? That's a word that uh, is a very specific adjective used for a few types of things, one of them being court cases. And basically it means one that has um, overturned a long history of practice, uh, establishing a new precedent. Uh, of course, the Supreme Court is the ultimate court in the country. So its pronouncements are extremely important in um, not just changing legal policy, but the effect that that has on people's actual lives, which of course we're gonna hear from uh, with Mr. Mahara's presentation later. So I just wanna take you very quickly. Um, we have some things, of course, that we're not gonna be able to cover all during this webinar. So if you hadn't had a chance to look at the newsletter yet, here's a quick overview. Uh, we do have a lesson idea on Tinker versus Des Moines, a 1969 case about student right to protest, specifically uh, wearing the armbands for peace during the Vietnam War. Uh, so if you're doing modern American history, this is a good one to use. Marbury versus Madison, uh, which I was shocked to discover that most of my students haven't even heard of, uh, despite its importance. Well, we're going to hear how important it is a little bit later from Kira. Uh, we're going to be talking about this one, the Korematsu versus the United States, uh, 1944, specifically dealing with Japanese American internment. And that's where we're going to hear from our special guest speaker. Uh, I'm going to come back uh, later in the webinar to talk to you a bit more about Schenck versus the United States. It's not quite as famous, but it is famous in terms of the uh, precedent establishes for free speech during wartime. And then on page four, we have three additional cases, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, of course, landmark case that establishes separate but equal ushering in the era of Jim Crow laws, uh, Worcester versus the state of Georgia, which was a case that uh, supported um, the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation and other American Indian nations, but which was ignored um, 
by Andrew Jackson when he um, promulgated the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And then another one from more recent memory, Miranda versus Arizona. So anyone who's watched a police procedural on TV has heard the Miranda rights being spoken to people when they're getting arrested. And so what's the case behind that? Here's your little story here. Uh, and then we also have a little profile of Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who has been involved in at least a couple uh, landmark cases so far in her career, uh, particularly Obergefell versus Hodges, which established marriage equality, and Citizens United. So you can click on those for more information. There's one more thing I want to show you, uh, and it's in our important links box. Uh, and it is this uh, link here called Landmark Supreme Court Cases. It's a website that we are not affiliated with, but which we found incredibly useful for teaching these things in the classroom. So this is what it looks like. And it has a certain amount of cases that it highlights. And the cool thing is it's created a lot of really good educator materials for both students and teachers uh, so, for instance, they're, they're differentiated by grade levels, they have summaries of the decisions, so they already have handouts, uh, they've already gone through all that legal language and excerpted parts that are the most important. So we use some of these during some of uh, our lesson ideas in this issue, but it's a really good website and so we recommend it. I am now going to turn it back over to Kira. All right, so I'm going to talk to you guys about Marbury versus Madison. Um, and this is one of those, uh, as much as I like Supreme Court cases, I didn't actually know that much about it until we were uh, doing some reading last uh, year for our virtual book club. Um, and in reading the section about this one, uh, I was amazed that I, I didn't know more about it to begin with. Um, so this is really the case where we get the birth of the idea of judicial review. So to get started with this, it's important to kind of take us back and think about, you know, what is the role of the Supreme Court? So when we think about the Supreme Court today, we think about it as, you know, one of three um, co-equal branches of government. Yet, you know, in the early years of the country, that was not really so much the case. Um, and this is the case that really, uh, this Supreme Court decision actually changes that. And so, you know, in those early years, the Supreme Court, um, one, didn't have a building. Um, two, they were basically riding on a circuit. Um, so they were, you know, going out, uh, you know, riding around through the area. Um, and it was really not seen as that, uh, you know, prestigious of a position. In fact, you know, they had a, a really hard time for a while getting someone to serve as chief justice um, in the early years. Um, and so, you know, we really, we, of course, we think of that very, very differently now. Um, and one of the reasons that the Supreme Court did not uh, have kind of that co-equal branch is that when they were trying to convince folks to support the new constitution, many people were kind of skeptical of, of courts and judges uh, because of bad experiences within the British system. Uh, and so Hamilton and others really kind of convinced them that, you know, that the judicial branch and the Supreme Court would be fairly weak. And, you know, and in truth, in the early years, it was. Um, but that, of course, changes um, after the election of 1800. Um, and so in understanding the importance of this case, you really have to dig in and do a little bit of historical context around the election of 1800 um, and kind of what was going on then. Of course, we know that is the election where Thomas Jefferson uh, defeats John Adams and becomes president. Um, but one of the important things to keep in mind in that election is just the level of kind of partisan tension um, that took place. Uh, and this is the first time that we see that, again, that peaceful transfer of power happen when John Adams uh, in his Federalist Party loses. Uh, and for the first time, they have to hand over power to the other political party, which was Jefferson and his uh, Democratic Republicans. And a lot of people were really kind of uncertain about, you know, how all this would work out because there had been uh, so much acrimony and tension throughout the, uh, the election. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, you know, when it come time for Jefferson to be uh, inaugurated, that happened. But before that happened, between the election and the inauguration, um, Adams and other Federalists were working to try to uh, put in as many people um, of their party as they could, especially within the judicial branch, to make sure that they still had some say in the government going forward. And that kind of lays the foundation for what the conflict is um, in the Marbury versus Madison case. 
Now, for this lesson idea, I found a really interesting letter that I think that you could use with your students to kind of, again, dig in to this, um, this case a little bit. And so this letter is written by Thomas Jefferson shortly after his inauguration. Uh, and he's writing to Henry Knox, um, who was the former Secretary of War. He'd served in George Washington's um, cabinet. He was also a Revolutionary War hero, and he was a prominent Federalist. And again, kind of keep in mind that you know, tension that was going on between the two political parties and, and their supporters. And so in this letter, uh, previously, and I've excerpted it, previously in the letter, he's again talking about this tension and the need to kind of bring people together. And so here he says, all our citizens agreed in ancient Whig principles, and I thought it advisable to define and declare them and let them see the ground on which we could rally. And the fact proving to be so that they agree in these principles, I shall pursue them with more encouragement. I am aware that the necessity of a few removals may be misconstrued as done for political opinions and produce hesitation in the coalition so much to be desired. But the extent of these will be, to, will be too limited to make permanent impressions. In the class of removals, however, I do not rank the new appointments, which Mr. A, of course, is to be president, uh, former President John Adams, crowded in with whip and spur from the 12th of December when the event of the election was known and consequence, consequently that he was making appointments not for himself, but his successor until nine o'clock of the night at 12 o'clock of which he was to go out of office. This outrage on decency should not have its effect except in the life appointments, which are irremovable. But as to the other, I consider the nominations as nullities and will not view the persons appointed as even candidates for their offices much less as possessing it may be any title meriting respect. I mention these things that the grounds and extent of the removals may be understood and may not disturb the tendency to union. So thinking about what Jefferson is telling Knox here, why do you guys think that this might be important? Why is he uh, wanting to share this message with Henry Knox, again, a very prominent uh, Federalist um, in the Northeast? So to get this straight here, he's talking about appointments that Adams made on his way out that Jefferson is now supposedly stuck with. Yes. Yeah, so Adams, like ah. in the, the waning hours of his presidency, he was you know furiously working at night trying to appoint as many judges as he could. That actually had created new <laughs> judgeships and trying to put this in sounds these sounds familiar. Judges. Yeah. So but they, they had done so many and done them at the last minute that not all of the commissions could be sent out. And so when Jefferson arrives in DC and takes over, there are these commissions that Adams had left, but had never been sent out. And so Adams is basically like, here, yeah, we're gonna throw those out. We're not, we're not appointing those people. Um, and that gets to the crux of the problem here. Um, oh. So what happens in this case is that uh, James Marbury, uh, who was one of those people who had been commissioned, uh, sues James Madison, who is Jefferson's Secretary of State, uh, and basically says, Adams appointed me, I should be judge. Uh, and then, you know, Madison, they were like, no. Um, so John Marshall, who is the Chief Justice, of course, writes the unanimous opinion on this. Um, and interestingly enough, John Marshall is cousins to Thomas Jefferson, and they don't like each other. Uh, so, and Marshall is also a Federalist. Uh, but within the decision, uh, you know, Marshall basically is able to kind of walk a tightrope. Uh, and he says, you know, it's fine, we're not going to appoint these folks, but at the same time, the law in which they were, uh, you know, that we were looking at, which is what the Judicial, uh, Judiciary Act, I think that one's 1802, um, this one is actually, it's not constitutional, or sorry, it's the 1801 Act, it's not constitutional, and this is the first time that we get the Supreme Court saying that a, a piece of legislation is not constitutional. So, Again, so it's pretty complicated, which is where especially our eighth grade students may need some guidance. So there's a couple of really good pieces that I have found um, that you could use to get help them build in some of this context, because you do have to understand, again, what was happening with, you know, the election and again, that, you know, the, the political tensions of the time. 
So the Bill of Rights Institute has a video that's included in the lesson uh, idea that is about three minutes in length. And again, it's a good, super short overview of what's happening. For our high school students, again, especially teaching U.S. government, uh, there is a video that I found by SOMO Publishing, which again is the same group who did the uh, Too Late to Apologize uh, Declaration of Independence music video. This one's longer, it's about 11, 12 minutes, uh, but again, it's a really good kind of overview of both the history of the case as well as, again, the, the principle and idea of judicial review. Now, of course, Stacy just showed us the landmark uh, cases website, and that is where you can find this case excerpted. Um, because, of course, you can find the full decision at the Library of Congress. But oftentimes, I mean, you know, those are really long; they're complicated. So, if you can find somewhere where these things have been excerpted for you, you should definitely make use of that. And this has got a really good one. Uh, and I'm going to show you in just a second kind of the pieces that I would would particularly want to pay attention to. And then finally, um, the Library of Congress through uh, the Constitution and Congress.gov has an annotated constitution. And there's an article about the judicial vesting clause that really also gets into the nitty gritty about uh, judicial review and why this case in particular is important. Uh, and so again, if you're teaching US government in high school, that is a really great resource to pull in and get even more background and context on this to help our students again understand why this case is so significant because really it's because of Marbury versus Madison that we have the Supreme Court uh, that has the power that it has today. Now one interesting factoid as I'm pulling up uh, that uh, the, the excerpt of this so this is the first time that we get the idea of judicial review do you know what the next time that the Supreme Court strikes down a law is actually uses this power it is in 1857 with the Dred Scott decision. So we have this decision that again is 1803, um, and then you don't have them actually use this power again until 1857 with the Dred Scott decision. So uh, again, that excerpt from Landmark's cases um, can be found here. Uh, and so really what you wanna pay attention to, if you can only do a small snippet of this is on page two going into page three. Um, and you'll see here that case says it is in, it is emphatical that the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each. And then you can see he ends uh, this excerpt with this is the very essence of judicial duty. And so again, establishing the idea of judicial review and giving the court the power to say what is and what is not constitutional. So hopefully that gives you guys some ideas uh, and maybe kind of get, you know, piques your interest a little bit into this case. Um, again, I, I found it pretty interesting as I've looked at it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy. Thank you, uh, Kira. Um, now we're gonna look at another example uh, from our newsletter, uh, jumping ahead in time over a hundred years to take a closer look at a case from 1919 called um, Schenck versus the United States. And so I'm going to just scroll down to where you can see it in our newsletter edition. So um, Kira mentioned already that the Library of Congress has all of these primary sources, and it does. Uh, and I'll show you what it looks like, because if you just click on this very first link, um, it comes up as part of the US reports. You know, It has all the congressional and all the Supreme Court reports uh, as part of its collections. Um, and you can download the PDF. And this one's only seven pages, but again, it's seven pages of, you know, the full decision, which, you know, if you have some high school students doing some deep research, then you want to send them here. But if you're just trying to cover the most important parts of this during a class period, you may want to go with some of the more excerpted uh, sources. Um, which is why I also include a link to the excerpt from landmarkcases.org. Uh, that's the second link here. But so what is Schenck versus United States? Well, it's about free speech. 
particularly free speech during times that the United States is at war. So of course, this one is a World War I topic. And it is directly named in the curriculum standards. So you are going to have to mention uh, to this to students at some point what Shank is. Um, so this is the one where you get the justice uh, using the analogy of, well, you can't have free speech that endangers people like shouting fire in a crowded theater. Uh, that's something that we've probably already heard of or even said before. And we can basically agree with the reasonableness of that. And this is also very important for sending, setting this precedent, this test of whether language presents itself as um, leading to clear and present danger. And the first time I ever heard that phrase was in a Tom Clancy novel. But anyway, um, so what is clear and present danger? This is where it comes from. And the Supreme Court justice that we can um, thank for, for these is actually Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Uh, who was one of the most influential Supreme Court justices of all time. Uh, and uh, he actually was one of our longest serving Supreme Court justices as well. As a young man, he had fought in the Civil War. Um, so if you've heard the, the quote in the Ken Burns series, in our youths, our hearts were touched with fire, that's this Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, Jr. His dad was also famous as being a writer. Uh, so he had a very long and very influential legal career, and he's the one who hands down the majority decision. Now, there is no dissenting opinion here because it was a unanimous decision. Um, and the decision was, yes, the, the United States government has the right to limit free speech during times of war. And uh, so in a way, this is upholding the Espionage Act of 1917 passed during, uh, of course, the Woodrow Wilson administration, severely cutting down on um, certain liberties uh, to ostensibly help with the war effort, particularly the war effort of drafting men to serve in the US Armed Forces. So who was Shank? Shank, his first name is Charles, Charles Shank, was a member of the Socialist Party at a time when the Socialist Party was actually pretty prominent in American politics. And um, he opposed the military draft. And so he and one of his colleagues, Elizabeth Baer, um, printed up about 15,000 copies of a flyer which I do not have a link to uh, in this, but you can find, you can take a look at what it looks like uh, through, I believe like Google has it uh, somewhere on Google Scholar or something. Um, it looks like this. So it's front back, assert your rights. And basically what it's saying is, let's see if I can, yeah. If you can see between the two bars, it's saying that the 13th amendment, which we all know is the one that abolished slavery, um, says that, you know, nobody can be held in involuntary servitude. And that's the basis that he's using to encourage people to resist the draft, the 13th Amendment. Um, okay. And so I, he's, you know, they're arrested and they're charged with violating the Espionage Act of 1917. And they end up losing this court case because uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and all the other justices uh, agree that yes, um, the government has this right and therefore upholding this act, which is still on the books today. This is the same act that uh, people of recent memory were charged with like um, Edward Snowden and Julian Assange. Um, the guy who did the Pentagon Papers was arrested under this. So this is quite a, a a, a pretty influential act here. Um, and so you can begin talking about this by just asking students, what do they think the limits of free speech are? Um, what does it cover? You know, I think they can understand that shouting fire in a crowded theater is a no-no, but um, you know, what does it cover? Uh, there's a lot of talk about free speech these days. And does that mean that it's free from censure or just free from government reprisal. I mean, those are things that you're gonna have to 
clarify with your students. What do they mean by it? And then ask them, do you think that there are pluses and minuses to restricting the right to free speech when we are at war? Um, so there is a video that's linked here. You can see this. And uh, like the one that Kira mentioned, it's also put out by the Bill of Rights Institute. Uh, I'm not going to play this video, but I do want to show you um, that it's in a, uh, okay, if you just go to the Bill of Rights Institute's YouTube channel, they actually have um, playlists. So if you go to their playlists, they, they do have uh, playlists of AP government required Supreme Court cases. And so though that playlist right there has a lot of these landmark Supreme Court cases. And so I recommend, uh, and they're, they're only like three minutes or something uh, long each. So I, I do recommend um, taking a look at those uh, if you want just some sort of quick way to go over the case for students. And then uh, the lesson plan has uh, this, newspaper article. So they, they haven't looked at the actual judicial language yet. Uh, basically, we're looking at this from the point of view of people reading the newspaper. What would they learn about this? And so the high court favors espionage statute. And so, um, you know, while not directly on the question of the constitutionality of the Espionage Act, so this is not a case where the Supreme Court is reviewing whether or not this piece of legislation is constitutional, which would be judicial review, but the Supreme Court in disposing of proceedings involving interpretation of that statute today, in effect, held that the so-called enlistment section or the draft is not an interference with the right of freedom of speech provided for by the constitution. And now here it, it um, quotes Oliver Wendell Holmes. When a nation is at war, the court held an opinion rendered by Justice Holmes, many things that might be said in time of peace are such a hindrance to his efforts that their utterance will not be endured so long as men fight and no court could regard them as protected by any constitutional right. So that there is the heart of what he's saying, which is pretty much, yeah, you have the right to say this when we're at peace. But the same thing said during times of war are not, it is not protected speech. And so that's the highlight. Go away, go away. Sorry. Okay, and if you want your students to read more of the opinion, you can look at the excerpt from the unanimous opinion on the landmarkcases.org website. Uh, particularly the part where he talks about the question in every case is whether the words are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. So that's another um, phrase that uh, ends up, oops, that ends up setting a precedent. And actually uh, this also links to the First Amendment Encyclopedia, which I have to give a shout out to. This is um, a project of uh, the, um, one of our M MTSU um, departments where it's talking about the clear and present danger test um, and how that has been applied in other cases uh, through the years. And then finally, uh, you can, uh, if you choose, uh, bring into this uh, that as an amendment to the Espionage Act of 1917, uh, Congress passes the Sedition Act of 1918, which was later struck down, but not before other people were arrested under it, including Eugene Debs, who is the most prominent socialist in the United States at this time, because he ran for president on the Socialist Party ticket about five times, the last time from jail. Why was he in jail? Because he violated the Espionage Act. And so um, it's uh, a, just a very logical 
kind of progression from the Schenck versus United States decision. And we happen to have a close reading exercise about this on our website. So that's also linked from here uh, if you'd like to look at it this way. So this has excerpts from two of his speeches. One is an anti-war speech, and this is the one that led to him getting arrested. And then the other one is where he delivers a statement at his sentencing hearing. And so basically what he's talking about in this anti-war speech, um, he's very aware that his speech is being limited by these laws, but he thinks that he can maybe fit it into the legal category, but alas, um, but he's basically talking about how people, why would all these people fight? It's a rich man's war and they're the ones that tell you to go to war and they're the ones that declare the peace. And so what's in it for the people who actually fight, which in a way is kind of the same thing that Schenck uh, was saying in his flyer, um, trying to urge people to resist the draft because socialists were on the side of the working people who usually bear the brunt of wartime, uh, you know, burden of fighting uh, and, and don't really gain much from it. So uh, that would be a, a very logical extension to this. And so, yeah, I, that's about all I wanted to cover with this very interesting case. And now I'm gonna throw it back to Kira so that she can introduce our guest speaker for today. Thank you, Stacey. So we are really fortunate today uh, to be joined uh, by Sam Mahara, um, who I had the pleasure of uh, hearing him present at one of the National Council for History Education conferences uh, several years back. And he also had a, presented um, at the Tennessee Council for History Education conference a couple years ago as well. Uh, Mr. Mahara is a second generation Japanese American um, who was born in the 1930s and raised in San Francisco. Um, after the beginnings, uh, after World War II broke out, uh, he and his family uh, were sent to a det detention camp in Panoma, uh, California, and then uh, they were sent to one of the uh, Japanese internment prison camps in Wyoming. Um, after the war, uh, he and his family were able to return to, South, uh, to San Francisco, um, where he finished his education. Um, he worked as a rocket scientist with the Boeing Company uh, for his career until he retired there. Uh, now, Mr. Mahara um, is a guest uh, is a speaker uh, working to try to educate people uh, about this moment um, in our history uh, and help to make sure that we do not have future uh, violations of people's civil rights like this. So again, thank you, Mr. Mahar, for joining us today. We're going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. I pre appreciate the opportunity to be able to address all of you. Um, and uh, uh, let me ask you a quick question. I don't know if I can see a raise of hands, but how many of you have heard me when I was there in uh, Nashville, maybe about five years ago? Uh, so I take it not too many of you. That's, that's OK. Oh, I have one. And, uh, and that's fine. Um, I, wanna, I wanna start out with, by giving you a quick summary of the talk that I usually give uh, because it, it puts the Korematsu case in context as to you know, why uh, it happened. And so uh, I've got a few slides. I'm gonna uh, share screen and go to my PowerPoint. And you should see my file. And I'll go to slideshow from the start. Now you should see my uh, title chart. So I, I call this, uh, the talk I call it personal stories of imprisonment because that's what I remember. And um, I went in at age nine, came out at age 12. So I have a pretty good memory as to what, what were the um, important things that happened uh, during that time. Um, to start out, there was a speech uh, given by President uh, George Bush at the grand opening of the of National African American uh, Museum in, in Washington. And uh, his first sentence uh, of that speech ran something like this. Great nation does not hide its history. It faces its flaws and corrects them. A great nation, a great nation does not hide history. I love that, and, and that's what I've been using on all my talks 
ever since uh, President Bush made that statement. But let me start out by uh, introducing you to my family. Um, that uh, defiant brat with the folded arms, that's me. I was uh, about eight years old in this photograph. Uh, my brother next to me, my father behind me, my mother standing to the right, and grandpa and grandma Mihara are seated. The elder Mihars were the immigrants. They're the ones who, who came from Japan. And my grandparents really uh, made a great decision uh, because they were in a working class and uh, they wanted their son to be, uh, you know, uh, to, to be, have, a, have a better life. And so they, they, um, they got him into a, a really good school in, in Japan, uh, comparable to uh, Harvard. And my father's major was in uh, English, you know, so now he's, he's very good in English and he's very good in Japanese. So um, he found a job in San Francisco as a newspaper writer. And uh, he married, he met my mother and got married. And I, my brother and I therefore were born in San Francisco. We are American citizens uh, by birth. Uh, so that's how the Mahara clan began in the, in the United States. After Pearl Harbor, life became really miserable for a lot of people, especially Japanese and also uh, other uh, people of uh, German and Italian ancestry. And uh, we started seeing these kinds of political cartoons. Here's a, a Japanese soldier with a bloodied knife and a, a Nazi German soldier. They're both encroaching over the United States. And the caption, our homes are in danger now. That implies it's the people living in the United States who are of Japanese and German ancestry, who are the suspects. They are the ones who could cause the most damage and something must be done about this problem. And so this, this type of cartoon uh, helped to promote the hysteria uh, that took place right after uh, December the 7th, 1941. President Roosevelt made many good decisions. He made a huge mistake. What he did was he listened to his advisors on the issue of what do we do about the German and the Japanese uh, people living in this country. And uh, these uh, military advisors recommended <clears throat> that uh, the president sign an executive order which gives the authority to remove people, that authority being given to the local military. So uh, the bill uh, did not name, I mean, the order did not name Japanese or Germans or Italians. It simply said anyone can be removed on the orders of the military. And he signed that on a very important date, February 19th, 1942. Now, who were the military people in 1942 who had the authority to remove people? Well, here's a map of the various districts. There were five districts in the United States. An Eastern section, Eastern Defense Command, uh, General Drum was in charge of an area that had many Germans, many Italians, and a few Japanese. And the Central Defense Command, mainly in the Northern US, General Lear had responsibility, a uh, similar responsibility. Southern Defense Command, which includes Tennessee, uh, General Kruger was in charge. Way out in the Pacific, there's a Lieutenant General Emmons, he's in charge of Hawaii. So those four generals decided not to remove anyone, not to remove Germans or Italians or Japanese. However, and there's one general in the Western Defense Command named General John DeWitt. It turns out he was a racist. He hated Japanese. He didn't hate Germans or Italians, but he hated Japanese. Now, what's the evidence that person hates a person, a, a race? Well, General DeWitt left a trail of evidence. For example, he defined anyone with a part Japanese blood. He defined it as one sixteenth blood. You are a Japanese. In other words, if you had a great great grandparent, one of them, who was Japanese, and the rest of the fifteen uh, grandparents were non-Japanese, it doesn't matter. General DeWitt says you are Japanese. So he he went searching for these people who are part uh, Japanese, and he found them. And for example. Here's a photograph taken 
of Japanese Americans with at least partial Japanese parents and partial non-Japanese. You can tell by looking at their faces that they clearly are not 100% Japanese. And he found them in orphanages because in those days it was popular to put orphans uh, of mixed parents into orphanages. Uh, look on the third row, those are babies being held by guardians, Japanese guardians. Now, this photograph was taken in a prison camp called Manzanar in California. And General DeWitt ordered all of these kids to be removed and placed in this particular prison camp. And, and as a result, that's another evidence of the fact that he hated them so much that he demanded the removal of all these people especially from the Western states of California, Oregon, and Washington. So here's a typical family being removed. Uh, now the, the, the kids are wearing dog tags. I remember my tag, it had my name, it had my uh, prisoner number. And uh, that's the way the government controlled us to make sure we get on the right buses and trains to take us to the proper uh, prison camp because there are a lot of people of Japanese ancestry, 120,000 of us. So here are the trains that finally came to, to uh, pick us up. And now the, the military is uh, shoulder to shoulder, carrying weapons, making sure we get on the train, each of us carrying a hand carry, and that's all we were allowed to bring to get on that train. And I remember getting on that train and staying on there for three days and nights never knowing where we were going. They never told us. And the guards were at all of the exits to make sure we don't escape. So it was a prison train from, from California all the way to Northern Wyoming where our camp was located. Not everyone agreed to go. One of them, one of the three decided not to go. And, uh, and uh, the one that I wanna talk about briefly is, is a guy named Fred Korematsu. Fred was a welder in Oakland, California. He worked at a naval shipyard. On December the 7th, he was fired because of the sensitivity of the job. Fred had a dilemma because what he had, he had an Italian girlfriend, that is a white girl, and they had plans. They were gonna get married. And they're going to avoid, they're going to, Fred's going to change his name, and they're going to avoid being caught, and they're going to stick around and, and uh, get married. And by the way, they, they couldn't marry in California in those days uh, because of the laws against mixed marriages. So they had to, to go away to either Mexico or some other state. And so Fred needed money. And what he, what he did was uh, he had plastic surgery. And on the left, you see, before surgery, on the right, the surgeon was supposed to make him look white. That is, the, the result is supposed to make him look white. And it turns out, the photo on the right, after surgery, he still looks Japanese. I would ask my money back. That's ridiculous. But he lost all his money on the surgeon who failed, and he was caught. And as a result, the case went to a lower court. They found him guilty because he violated General DeWitt's rules. That was the law, and so he was uh, sentenced to go to prison. The case went up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court decided six to three that he shall remain guilty and remain in prison. So what are the highlights of the court uh, decision? And that's on the, uh, the uh, uh, summary of the case from the Supreme Court. Uh, the 63 decision, was, the conviction was affirmed. Now, Justice Black was writing for the court, and here are his comments. The conviction stands. We are at war. Exclusion from his own is necessary. And the removal order was constitutional. Protection against espionage outweighs individual rights. Now, what's significant is the phrase protection against espionage. There was not a single case of a conviction against any of the 120,000 Japanese in the Western section. In fact, even across the entire country, there was not a single case of a conviction of someone of Japanese ancestry conducting espionage. 
And yet, the, the theory here is that the Supreme Court said we must protect against a potential espionage of a particular race. What's well, awful, but let me show you about what the, the uh, dissenting justices said. Roberts said Korematsu was being punished because of ancestry. There was no evidence of disloyalty. It's clearly a violation of constitutional rights. Justice Murphy said exclusion of a race is racism and therefore unconstitutional. Equal protection is guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment. And when you, you know, imprison Japanese and not imprison Germans and Italians, that is unequal. There's no question about it. And lastly, Justice Jackson said no evidence of a military necessity. And Korematsu's crime resulted from being born of a different race and military orders should not be enforced if it's unconstitutional. All outstanding arguments, but clearly the vote stood 63. So the Korematsu case went down as the landmark case and you know, one of the worst decisions made uh, by the Supreme Court. Well, let me quite quickly wind down on what happened after that. Uh, we all were assigned to, to prisons. The little dots on the left are temporary uh, prisons that were uh, converted horse race tracks. And then we were there for three months and then we were assigned to go to individual uh, major camps that's in triangles, the bold black triangles. And the one I went to was in Wyoming, Heart Mountain, Wyoming. It was one in Idaho, one in Utah, <clears throat> one in Southeast Colorado, two out in Arkansas, two in Southern Arizona, and two on the Eastern slopes of California. They held an average of about 10,000 people. The one at Tule Lake was the largest. They held up to 18,000. So these are our massive prison camps that held a lot of the families. So here's a photograph of the camp itself at Heart Mountain. That's the, that's the mountain in the background that's shaped like a heart. That's where it got its name. Uh, the barracks on the left are tar paper covered barracks. There are 450 of them. And on the right, you see the barbed wire fence and the guard towers. And in the, in the distance on top of the hill, you can see another guard tower. But there were nine of these guard towers. And I remember when I went to the camp, I saw these guards uh, with weapons. Here are more details of the security system. The guard on the left is on top of the guard tower. He had a, a 30 caliber rifle pointing in toward the barracks. In the middle are the details of the guard tower, which is, uh, has, has the floodlights. And on the right side, <clears throat> very important, are signs along the perimeter in English and in Japanese. It said, stop, you know, don't go beyond this point because if you do, you can get shot. That is a definition of a prison. We were imprisoned from all of that uh, activity that resulted in our, our places like the Heart Mountain facility. <clears throat> this is a summary, a detail of the barrack we lived in. There were six rooms. The end ones were the smallest. Uh, next to the end were the largest that held up to seven people. And the middle ones were medium sized. That's where my family went. That is my brother, myself, and my two parents. So four of us in a room, 20 feet by 20 feet. And when you stretch out the beds, there's not much room for anything else. Uh, there was no inner wall, there was no insulation. It looks like you're, you walk into a storage shed because you see the inside surface of the outside wall. No water, no electricity. There was a single light bulb in the ceiling. And that was our home for three years. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the family taken right in front of the barrack. That's me in a white shirt, my brother in a sweater, my mother on the left and the three sisters, my three aunts in the middle and an uncle. The toilets were embarrassing. Uh, at least they had the decency to have a separate toilets for men and women. But after typically a breakfast meal, there'd be a line of some 300 people outside. If you're lucky to get a seat, you have to sit down on a bowl, there's no seat. And there are nine faces looking at you while you're doing your business. Very, very embarrassing because there was no partition. The food that we ate, you can see on the table, there was bread and potatoes. And the mother's eating a plate of pickled vegetables. And I remember in that pitcher was powdered milk. 
I've sworn off powdered milk for the last 80 years because of my memories of bad taste of powdered milk. The winters were miserable. The first winter, it got down to minus 28 degrees. I'm not sure how cold it gets in Tennessee, but I swear minus 28 was awful compared to California. You know, we were, we have boring weather in California. Never saw snow and ice until we got to Wyoming. So that was a very difficult time. We had a hospital, very simply 17 barracks connected with a corridor. Our family had a lot of problems medically. In particular, my father had a case of glaucoma of his eyes. And uh, he was being treated in San Francisco by a specialist for about 20 years. And he was able to maintain his eyesight. But once we got to Heart Mountain, no such skills. The doctors were made up of other prisoners. At the best, they were general practitioners. You know, they were good at fixing broken bones and delivering babies, but certainly not problems like glaucoma. As a result, my father went blind, never saw again once he entered the camp. And that made life extremely difficult for our family. We had a funeral for grandpa because he died in the camp. The funeral was inside a barrack. Uh, that's me in a white shirt, my father next to me and my mother in a veil. And something was strange. I watched my grandfather in the hospital. He, he was down to skin and bones in a matter of about three months and he, he passed on. And I got a hold of his medical records that were in the National Archives. And I read them, I could not believe my eyes. The government was doing, I mean, the, the doctors were doing an experiment on grandpa. They were trying to cure his uh, cancer colon cancer by starving him, by denying him food. The records clearly showed he was not given intravenous feeding. In fact, they gave him a laxative for cancer. So that told me a lot about the quality of the medical care. It's an example of the kind of inhumane treatment that uh, people receive at these types of, uh, of uh, prison camps. Uh, but toward the very end, uh, there was a hero attorney in San Francisco named James Purcell. He filed a lawsuit that it was unconstitutional to hold us in such a condition for such a long time. And for loyal American citizens, uh, that should not have been done. So the Supreme Court finally, in the case of Mitsuo Endo versus United States, decided to release these people and let them all go back home. And that's how we got back on the trains and took us back to our homes in California, Oregon, and Washington. And the government decided to get rid of the camp. They sold each barrack for a dollar a piece and uh, sold them to returning veterans from World War II and encouraged them to create new farms and new businesses. Uh, and they cleared the land. And so there was no barracks left. And so we're now in the process of trying to restore the camp, bring them back. Uh, it's a very, very active program that we have. When we got home, life was even worse than when we left because the hatred was really bad. And so uh, people had trouble finding jobs. They lost homes. Uh, it was not a, a pleasant experience for most of us. After 50 years, we finally got something that was done that we, want, we wanted and we needed, which is an apology from the government. And, and President Ronald Reagan saw it appropriate for, for a long time that uh, the people who were in prison like this deserves an apology and also some money. And so he signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, and that helped out uh, quite a bit. I received a letter two years after that from the first president, George Bush, with the key words, sincere apology, along with a small check that helped pay for the damages. So I wanna conclude with a thought, you know, why do these prison camps exist? Well, I already told you. I talked about the racial prejudice and I talked about the hysteria that was driven by the media. And I talked about some of the leaders who failed their obligation of uh, constitutional rights that we all had. But to think about this way, you know, at one time it was almost Germans, it was almost Italians, 
today, you know, it could be others. It could be Middle Eastern Americans. It could be Muslim Americans. And in a way it is Latino immigrant families. This might be your son looking at a guard wondering, where's he taking me? This might be your daughter inside the prison camp, not knowing and wondering how, you know, how long do I have to wait? Because I've been here three years, when do I get out? And this could be your son trying to climb out of a prison camp, not knowing there's a guard with a rifle pointing straight at him. So I simply say very simply, never again to anyone, not at all. So that's a quick summary of my talk. I do have a, a, a book I wrote with a lot more details, a personal life of what happened uh, before, during, and after the camp. Uh, it's available on my website. Uh, you're welcome to it. And more importantly, uh, if anyone in the audience is interested, uh, uh, that's what I, I do most of the time right now. I tour all over the country uh, giving talks, and I also do it uh, virtually. I have both the in-person as well as uh, uh, a talk uh, that I do on, uh, uh, on Zoom that works out quite well. And I'd be happy to do that with any of you uh, who are listening in today or any others that you feel that might be of interest. Yeah, just simply get a hold of me on my website. I'd be happy to do that. So with that, um, let's go back to the uh, stop screen chair. And uh, Kara, uh, do you want to handle the questions? Uh, yes, so yeah, if anyone has questions, if you guys want to drop those in the chat box. Uh, I know we did have someone who asked the question about uh, having some of the photos that you shared available. Um, is that something that's on your website or can you, you mind sharing those photos from your PowerPoint? Uh, sure, uh, very simply, uh, get on my website and ask the question. It's on the front page on the lower right corner, ask Sam a question. Uh, tell me who you are, give me your web address or email address and I'd be happy to send out a file of these charts that I use. No problem. Any other questions? Yes. So one uh, question. Um, so after uh, being uh, treated in such a horrible fashion, how did Japanese Americans continue their patriotism? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I didn't have time to talk about it, but uh, not many people realize um, even during the war, 30,000 Japanese Americans served for this country, uh, both in a voluntary uh, mode or uh, through the draft. Uh, and uh, uh, so there was no question that, you know, a huge majority felt strong affinity and loyalty to this country. Um, I, I look at it a little bit different way. Um, I look at my alternatives, uh, which is, um, you know, there are many countries in the world who, where they won't allow me to do what I'm doing right now, criticizing the government. Uh, and I feel that's a very, very important right and a capability that I cherish. And to be able to do that and talk about the, the weaknesses and the problems we've had and the leaders of this country who made mistakes, you know, that, that's important to me. That's the way I teach. And, and uh, I think it's important to all of you you know, and, uh, you know, President Bush made the right statement, you know, we can't hide history, we have to reveal the mistakes as well as the good things that have been done. And so I, I, I really cherish the fact that I'm able to do that. And, uh, and that's what keeps me going. I feel very strongly that, uh, you know, I feel patriotic, I feel that it's important for people uh, to, uh, to uh, obey the laws and, and uh, respect the Constitution at the same time. So another question we had, uh, what advice do you have, especially for students who are facing discrimination today? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, there's, there's something that, uh, well, there's a, there's a general, general statement about discrimination. Uh, you know, it, it shouldn't happen. It, 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 there, there's no room for uh, racial or religious or other discrimination in this country. <clears throat> and, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, but in particular, <clears throat> since the pandemic began, there's been a really significant rise in the number of uh, crimes against Asian 
people of Asian ancestry, Chinese, Japanese, you know, others. And there's a correlation uh, between the start of the pandemic and the rise of these crimes. Uh, a factor of about 75% increase in the number of crimes. And all mostly ties to the types of the terminology being used at that time. When people started referring to the, uh, the pandemic as the, the Chinese flu, you know, or, or the uh, Kung flu, you've heard that phrase before. And there's an automatic uh, reaction, which is that all Asians, you know, are to be blamed, are to be responsible for the spread of the pandemic. And, and, and there's no need for that. Uh, if you have to use the terminology, call it by, by the medical term, which is, you know, COVID-19 um, or something similar. But you know, why relate it to a nation or a country uh, or a group of people or a locale? Uh, and so I, I think it's important to be mindful of uh, the terminology and avoid using terms that uh, tend to spread uh, hysteria that a particular group of people uh, are cause of a problem. And uh, I think that'll go a long way to helping the problem. Yeah. Anyone we else? Several people, again, just want to express uh, their appreciation and, and thanking you for, for sharing your story with us today mm -hmm. and, and their excitement Not to share that story with their students um, as we go forward. So again, uh, you know, be sure to check out uh, Mr. Mahara's uh, website. Uh, and again, if you are interested in possibly having him do a presentation for your students, uh, you can find information there on that side about how to do that. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to go ahead and drop those in the, the chat box uh, and we'll go ahead and start uh, working towards our wrap up because I know we are uh, just after uh, we've already passed our hour. So a couple of quick things. Uh, as we wrap up. Again, remember to check out the Padlet. Uh, and again, we've also uh, linked in, of course, that website from Mr. Mahara there. So you can find uh, you know, his information as well as uh, all the resources that he, he referenced. Um, one other uh, thing, uh, we want you, of course, to be sure to fill out our survey for today. Um, and that will also be sure to get you your PD certificate uh, for uh, your participation today. So Layla is going to drop the link for that in the chat box for those participating live. If you're watching the recording, uh, just go ahead and type in um, that web address there that will get you to our survey and we complete. Uh, uh, we go in and check those and send those out once a week um, if you're watching the recording. For those of you participating live, uh, we'll try to get your certificates out to you tomorrow. Um, so for next month, we will be uh, meeting on December the 14th, I'm sorry, December the 9th, wrong date, uh, Thursday, December the 9th, and our topic for next month is teaching with artifacts. So again, if that's something you're interested in, uh, definitely contact me and we will get you registered for that. Um, and then finally for today, uh, let's see here, if I can clear out my screen enough that I can find. All right, there we are. All right, so for our folks participating live here, we do have a book that we're going to be giving away. Our text for today, our free book, is Teaching U.S. History Beyond the Textbook uh, for Middle and High School. Uh, let's see here. So I think I've got everybody's name in here. So let's see who gets our book today. All right. Lisa, so Lisa, if you wanna uh, just message us your uh, address, we will get um, that mailed out to you. So again, thank you uh, so much for participating. Um, and again, thank you guys so much. Uh, we hope to see you next month. And again, thank you, uh, Mr. Mahar for joining thank us you. today. Thank yes, you. Thanks, Mr. Mahar, that was wonderful.